Good evening, everyone joining us. We're waiting on a few more people. So while we're waiting, if you'd like to use the chat just to tell us where you're visiting from today, where you're joining us from today, and why you're here. Marilyn's visiting from Jeanette. Hi, Marilyn, welcome. I keep saying visiting, but I guess it's more like Zooming. Mm -hmm. They're visiting virtually. Right. <laughs> Just a couple more moments, give people some time. Jan Rogers, textile historian and quilt documenter in Western PA, currently sitting in South Carolina to avoid snow and ice. Good for you, Jan. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Maureen from La Trobe. Welcome, Maureen. Thank you. Wendy Torbert, Imperial PA, in support of Tina Brewer and the Arts. Welcome. Happy to be here. <coughs> Thanks, Jan. Bob Arrett, he, him, oh. Greensburg. Welcome, Bob. Nice to see you. Anita Walker from Robinson. Welcome. Mm -hmm. We're so excited for our program tonight. We'll just wait a couple more moments for some folks to get yeah. in. Lindsay Gates, director of Touchstone Center for Crafts in Farmington. Mm. Awesome. Welcome, Lindsay. George and Ginny Leaner, if I'm saying that right. Much looking forward to what is sure to be a stimulating discussion. Thank you guys for joining us. Barbara's big brother, John, from Wellsville, uh -oh. New York. <laughs> uh -oh. Hello there, big brother. <laughs> Tina Ross from Ben Salem, PA, outside of Philly. The Westmoreland Museum was a highlight of living in Western PA for several years. Thank you so much, Tina. We miss you over here. Thanks for joining our program. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. So hi, everyone. Mm -hmm. My name is Hannah Vincent, and I'm the Public Programs Manager at the Westmoreland. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's program, which is, of course, Tina williams Brewer and Barbara Jones in conversation. And I would like to begin the program very quickly with a moment of acknowledgments. So the Westmoreland Museum of American Art is situated upon the traditional lands of the Adena, Hopewell, Monongahela, Osage, Delaware, Shawnee, and Seneca Cayuga peoples. We honor all of the indigenous nations and their land with great gratitude. We also acknowledge the enslaved Africans whose labor built this country during the colonial era and beyond. As a museum, we use the power of art to explore and reveal the complexity of American history in an effort to create a more just and equitable society. A couple of things before we begin as well. If you have any questions, any comments as well, please make sure you use the chat function. And I'll be checking in with Tina and Barbara as we go along if you have any questions. And feel free throughout the entire program to do that as well. But all right, thank you all so much for joining us. I'm going to turn it over now to our presenters, Tina Williams Brewer and Barbara Jones. All right, thanks, Hannah. Um, I am happy to be here and thanks everybody for joining. And thank you, Tina, for joining in this conversation. And thank you for your exhibition here in the museum. I'm sitting here in your gallery between two of your quilts. You can see them behind me. And I just want to say, Tina Williams Brewer is a fiber arts storyteller and a teacher. Her exhibition here at the Westmoreland runs through April 24th. It's a mini re retrospective of quilts she made from 1984 through 2021. She's called this region her home most of her life, having grown up in West Virginia and has lived and worked in Pittsburgh for over 50 years. We're gonna be begin tonight's conversation with a short video clip from a studio tour 
that the Westmoreland education and marketing teams produced during the pandemic to keep our audience engaged. So we will um, start there. Hi there, welcome to the East End of Pittsburgh at Homewood Russian. Welcome to my studio. I'm Tina Williams, we are a quilting artist. Come on in. You know, I am a storyteller, a quilt storyteller, and I'd like to tell a story now that I think is very important to where we are these days. It's about validation and the power of what. When I first started quilting, I was very apprehensive and didn't know how to do it. And so I worked with a group of ladies and one particular lady saw me struggling. And she came to me and she said, you know, you really don't have to do what everybody else is doing. What you're working on and how you're approaching the, the art form is so different, so unique. She says, I think you need to go with it. And her name was Adelia Moore. And so Adelia Moore encouraged me to, and gave me the power with him to be able to create my artwork and not be uh, involved with other people's opinion of what I was, I was doing. So my artwork has come from a place deep inside of me that really has to do with how I feel about my, my culture. So that was the way that I started out with validation for one. And through my entire career, I have tried to be that person for everybody that I come in contact to get them to be able to kind of feel what they're doing and to honor their process. And then the art will come. I'd like to talk about this piece, which I created back in 1987. Uh, it, when I created this, it was my interpretation of a phoenix bird. And I used my traditional method of needle turning applique. It's a very tight piece. I don't work like this anymore. And it had untraditional fabric in it, which meant transparent fabrics and upholstery fabrics because I used to be an interior decorator. So uh, it was unique in itself back in those days. So Tina, this is where we stop that video. Um, this is a really interesting quilt. You say it's one of your earliest quilts. So can you talk a little bit about it? Yes. Um, well, first of all, it is the first quilt that I ever sold. So that, mm -hmm. it, and the story that goes along with this, and if I get too long winded, stop me and say, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> but I made the piece um, to represent both of my grandmothers. I had my uh, maternal grandmother who was a um, kind of a simple but glitzy woman who dressed out of the secondhand stores and she wore sparkles all the time. So as I started to think about her, I knew that the fabric had to have reflective light in it. My other grandmother was very traditional. So I made both, I made this piece not knowing exactly what it was. I followed my muse. So the corners are uh, taken from a mask and it came from my very first African book that I received from my mentor in West Virginia. And, it ha and so I took that mask and reproduced it in fabric. I created this bird and I thought it was a peacock because I thought of my one grandmother as a peacock. But as I made the piece and then I put the fire around the piece. Um, it, I thought of it, well, it's a firebird. So I made several of these and this is the one that I sold. So it went out into the world and it came back. And when it came back, um, the person who purchased it, her husband was uh, liquidating some of her things. She transitioned and I thought maybe the Five Arts Guild might know who it belonged to and they recognized the work as my own, so they returned it to me. So the interesting thing about this story is this piece is called the firebird, but in, in actuality, it is a Sankofa bird. It is, uh, you have to know your past in order to move forward in the future. And at, so that, that kind of tells you that sometimes you don't always know exactly what it is that you're creating, and that you just need, but you can read it and you can read it. And well, that would have, was, would have been read in the nineties, 
But if you read it now in, in 2021, 22, it reads completely different because it is uh, coming from the flames. It's the Phoenix bird. So the Phoenix bird and the Sankofa bird together in this piece. So it has a whole new meaning to it. But the fact that it was gone and it came back kind of tells you it's ser serendipitous. And that is the way that my entire career has been. It's all been serendipitous. I always say I get what I'm supposed to have and I don't worry about what I didn't get. Okay, that's, that is really um, great information. I didn't realize that. And I didn't realize that the quilt came back to you. So that does sort of come full circle. Um, so Tina was selected as a master visual artist in 2013 and the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts and Media produced the next video that we're gonna see just a short clip from um, for the exhibition that was held at the Heinz History Center. So this short clip will give you a little bit of sense of her process. I use all of my forks. I don't save them back for good. In the villages, teaching was happening all the time. Teaching was done through a Paso. And the storyteller would tell the stories and, and would not miss a, a point of the story because he would touch each knob and that would keep him on track. I, that is what I needed, is to have something to keep me on track so I don't go drifting off. So all of my pieces that I do are called Lacasa, they're memory boards. And so once you gather the materials, then you need to put it into a comprehensive way of being and knowing so that you can tell the story. And it's okay with me if people don't really understand everything that I'm doing. Gather the materials, then you need to put it into a comprehensive way of being and knowing so that you can tell the story. And it's okay with me if people don't really understand everything that I'm trying to talk about, because if they look at it enough, they'll tell their own story. I started out with a traditional quilt, and this is a traditional quilt top. Each block has a newspaper on the back of it. Instead of having a paper bag, people save their newspapers. And they took the newspaper and they attached the fabric to the newspaper. So, so this is all hand sewed. Here. Having words that are attached to a piece and you're laying under it's like that absorbing of that energy of the word. So it's a it's a wonderful concept. But also because of the property in which people live, everything was so important. So scraps, scraps, scraps. When I started quilting, it was scraps, scraps, scraps because I was an interior decorator. So I was picking up behind all of the curtains and the upholstery. I didn't know how to quilt it all. I had a group of ladies that I visited with on Wednesday nights when my kids were really young. I asked questions and they told me, okay, they gave me direction. But then it was about how I was going to put it together that became the nuance of it. I was trying to create a quilt that looked like everybody else's, but I kept going back to being able to have something that was more purposeful work. So telling a story about my culture became part of what it is that was my passion. So it drove, it drove my work completely. So we stopped um, this, this um, video and uh, Tina's website is actually going to be in the chat, so you can go to her website and you can see the full video and they're, they're really wonderful and, and give you a lot more information. But we stopped here because um, this quilt <clears throat> is her first published project and they're, all of these early quilts, she says, are teaching quilts. So Tina, um, can you talk about your iconography in this quilt, your, a little bit about your process? and how these quilts were used <clears throat> as teaching tools? Okay, well, so this, that the first thing is I was teaching myself. These <laughs> quilts came to me <clears throat> as a need to know. Um, I received a, a gift from a friend, uh, a magazine with, that was called uh, American Vision. And it had a lithograph of the bottom of the slave ship, which I had never seen. And I was probably, close to 40 by then. And I was pretty 
drawn to it. And so I became impassioned about understanding how this how this happened, and I never really saw the the beginnings. I, the, well, not the beginnings, the suffering that is connected with a, with the uh, the slave trade. And so, this is the bottom of a slave ship. And my my friends um, gave me the lithograph, and I just started to do the research. So I used traditional concept of uh, strip piecing. So the background is formed first. There are like four different pieces of fabric put together to create the rectangle. Then the pieces are all done applique, which means that I needle turned each piece. The, they're all uniform because I used a giant eagle paper bag to make the patterns. And then I covered the patterns and then each one went down. I designed it as I went. So also then I knew that I wanted to create some uh, smaller quilts on the side for the aesthetics. And the, the smaller quilts are called the Underground Railroad or Jacob's Ladder. So each piece that is in the quilt represents another part of the story. At the bottom, there are, um, two, there are two staffs that are there, and those are the royal staffs to, to show that the Africans didn't come as just naked bodies. They came with a library in their head because of the oral tradition of the, um, of the, of the tri tribes. That's how they communicated and passed on the history. So all of the history that have been taught over centuries came with these Africans, enslaved Africans to the Americas. And my whole thing was to actually elevate this process and pull it out of the misery, but give some humanity to it. And so the top is the uh, harvest birds. And so somebody asked me, well, how does harvest have anything to do with the slave trade? Because literally these human beings were harvested from the motherland and brought to this country. And so there was always a celebration at, at, the, at, at the harvest time. So I wanted to elevate it and create that. So I have sequins and beads that also make it seem to be like something maybe you might wanna look at. The, uh, the pattern that's in the center of the quote is called the slave chain. And it's made from um, my father-in-law's ties, who was the first African-American mm -hmm. administrator at Pittsburgh Public School and my mentor, and who got me involved with understanding African uh, sculpture. So it, it has a personal meaning for me. And I, you know, I have not shown it for a, a while publicly, uh, but it, it goes to the schools. And so the children that I have been involved with all of these years, have been able to express themselves, understand what this process is about, and to kind of um, talk about it amongst themselves. And I, you, so we can it be comfortable with the idea that this needs to be talked about because it's part of our American history. There are four pieces in this, in this series, and one piece also belongs to the, um, the uh, State Museum in the permanent collection, and the other to belong to the African American Museum in Dallas, Texas. Great, that's okay. We'll move on, uh, Hannah, to the next slide. Okay, so we're moving very quickly through yeah. this. Through the um, there are many many quilts in between the harvest and uh, Humble Beginnings. Humble Beginnings was a piece that I did in 2006 when I had a grant, uh, a, well, it was a residency in, at the Clay Center in Charleston, West Virginia. And so they gave me a studio to work. So that's why I decided to do a very, very large piece. And um, at that time, my husband was working with the Pittsburgh Courier Archives. So I had access to all of these magnificent photographs. Now, um, so it was like humble beginnings, but we called it baseball and blues a bit too, because it's all about the athleticism and about the arts and the music and the dance. And it's very circular and holistic 
uh, when you think about it, the symbols that are at the bottom in turquoise is for um, it. I have a I have a corpus of symbols that I got from the Smithsonian Institution that I have intertwined throughout most of these quotes. There are a lot of reoccurring um, patterns that I use over and over again, but that means wealth. And so it really refers to how these musicians and artists, how they struggled to be able to have their process and how to be able to sing in clubs where they weren't allowed to go in the front door, where they went to, where they played uh, baseball and, and they were not allowed to be in, in the hotels. So this plays homage to that. Again, this piece is a combination of African fabrics and domestic fabrics. And then I started adopting another policy, uh, not another policy, but another practice, which is I use transparencies throughout my work. So the, um, the diamonds that you see represent the inside and the outside of, of what these artisans and athletes had to go through in order to accomplish their, their goals. And of course, we know that there wasn't a, the wealth there is now for athletes. And then the figure at the top represents the movement. So there's like, there should be always some movement that's going on in the work that carries you from one point to the other. And the figure at the top is uh, taken from a performance that Joyce Scott did here in Pittsburgh. She came, the Women of Visions brought her here and I did a photo study of her. And so I have, so she now is my muse and I use her like August Wilson used Ma Rainey in his work. And so she appears in many of the pieces. So Tina, <clears throat> a number of these, um, the, a number of the images in here are all created by Charles Tina Harris. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. They are all his images and, um, and they're done on an organza transfer and then superimposed on top of the, so a lot of the images also have the background fabric. So you can see the background fabric through the images when you see it up close. So for those of you that might not know who Teeny Harris was, um, he was a reporter for the Pittsburgh Courier, which was the preeminent African-American weekly newspaper, which was published from 1907 to 1966. It's still in business today as the new Pittsburgh Courier, and we'll see how Tina um, takes a look at that um, coming up. So the next slide is whirling dance and the unconscious rhythm. So if you'd talk a little bit about the patterns that you've decided to use in this quilt. Yes, um, I did this quilt for, for my mother and um, I wanted to represent the transition from generations to generations. Um, the background fabric uh, was the dark blue and I discharged the, the color from the fabric and I uh, superimposed a uh, and uh, a Dinkra symbol, one is for peace and one is for the drum. So it's it's peaceful, but there also is a call. I included traditional patterns in this piece, which is the, the, the whirling piece. That, again, we wanna see the motion that is happening with the work. And at this time, I was still trying to use traditional patterns because I still wanted people to think I was a real quilter, that I'm almost not really a real quilter. And, um, but because I was doing so uh, more crazy quilts than piecework. Piecework is when you put fabric together and turn it inside out and all the raw edges are inside. I prefer to use my images uh, over and over again and I cut them straight out and then I stitch them on with a herringbone stitch to adhere them to the background. So there is multiple layers that, that are there. There are about four layers. And then on top of it is a stitched layer, which is a spider web. So, and that represents the first creator was the spider. And so some of the African proverbs are involved in this. Again, you see in the center, you see the Sankofa bird, and then you see um, a number of symbols that rotate from the head of the Sankofa bird all the way around. So that, and it changes in the, into the color. Uh, it goes from red to orange to yellow. 
and um, there are symbols that mean fertility. They, they're referencing, you know, women's attributes of strength and tenacity. So, um, and I use it, I have a key on the back of most of these quilts because I realized I wasn't gonna remember them always. And so sometimes I have to flip them on the back and uh, refresh my memory. <laughs> That's great, I know I do that too. Well, you talk about multiple layers. So the next quilt, New Pittsburgh Courier, which we already mentioned briefly is, a, is an abundance of layers. And it's filled again with um, photographs from the Pittsburgh Courier of um, local and national personalities who all contributed to the visual and performing arts. So um, tell us a little bit about this and um, how you were able to achieve this design. Okay, so the, 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 I did 10 quilts um, before the uh, Pittsburgh Courier's um, 100th anniversary. And, um, and each one took on a, uh, a different concept. And this one was for destiny. And so it uh, is all the creative uh, muses. So I started with uh, Billy Strayhorn and Mary D up at the top. Billy Strayhorn was like, uh, uh, well, Billy Strayhorn was a Homewood, per, you know, he grew up in Homewood. So I was particularly interested in him. I did something for his family um, for a well, celebration that they had a national conference here for Billy Strayhorn. And of course, if you don't you know who Billy Strayhorn, he is take the A train. But I learned <laughs> from doing that particular quilt project, that commission work that I worked to music. And so I played, you know, all of Billy Strayhorn's music. I wasn't as familiar with Mary D, but she worked, I think, for, for Whammo, and she was um, mm -hmm. a DJ. And so there's a picture of her there. There's a British conductor named Rald Rald Rodolph uh, Dunbar, who is at the top. You never think about African-Americans being in classical music. So that was something that I thought was really important to be there. Alma Dumara. Jamal is on there. He is a uh, Westinghouse graduate. So I tried to I tried to mix people that were famous that but came from Homewood because I'm not from Homewood. I grew up in West Virginia, but I always felt that there was something very very special about Homewood and what Homewood had to offer. It's almost like it's the magic land, and there is so much talent that came out of Homewood that. Um, I think that that was one of the biggest things that I did with these quilts when I taught, I took them into the school and taught to children about it. I connected them first with things that they knew and then drew them back in history. Do you, do you know that this person came from here and this is what they did? So all of these are again, lacosses, which means that they are memory boards and, and the children can go through each photograph and ask about the person. And um, we have a myriad of very, very talented people that came from Pitts, came from Homewood in particular. John Wyman, a writer who also knew my husband, and I got a chance to meet him as well. Teeny Harris was here, lived down the street and around the corner. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, um, Marian Anderson is in there. Kat, Catherine Dunn was, um, her auntie lit, used to live across the street. So there's just so many connections if you have the time or someone has the time to be able to go back and pull that information up. So people really enjoy looking at this because they see Michael Jackson, which they would know. But um, some of these, like Diana Green, who was a African-American executive at Duquesne Light, who was a big, big supporter of the arts and really uh, you know, invested in artists. And uh, Phyllis Good, who was also there, who was a big supporter of the art and pushed it forward with Janice Starbuck to create a space for Black people to be able to showcase their artwork. So they had some special initiatives. And it just gave me a lot of joy to be able to spotlight them. And Elaine Hayes Freeland's on there as well. So there's a bunch. <laughs> That's great. That's fascinating. I mean, they all are people that you, some you recognize and some you don't. So it is, it's really fun to be really looking at them closely. Um, so the next quilt, you talk about your teaching and your students and how you um, want them to look at, you know, look closely at your work. And this next quilt is um, the sister quilts. 
and it is a teaching quilt. It was created by the students at the Ellis School here in Pittsburgh. Um, it was a collaborative process, um, as you said, most of your quilts are. But I understand you collaborated with another Pittsburgh master quilter, Jan Myers Newberry, who contributed the shibori dyeing technique that frames each quilt. So can you talk about um, how this um, teaching quilt came about and maybe a little bit about that process that people don't know about the shibori dyeing? About technique. the shibori. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Jan Myers Newberry is a, um, a master uh, shibori artist and she does the most fabulous quilts and she usually does geometric work uh, and she's very scientific in her work so Jan came over and the girls kind of <clears throat> told her the color she pulled out you know her samples so they could see it and then she took they chose this one which was periwinkle she went back and and the process is that she uses like a, a particular muslin um, but she also uses silk too, but usually it's my, this is muslin. And um, then you take a PVC pole and you wrap the muslin around it and then you push it down, put rubber bands on it, and then you put it into a dye bath. So there are several other processes that she does that I can't even begin to tell you how I, I just get all of her scraps and I'm so grateful to say <laughs> that she gives me buckets full and I always share them out with uh, the students when I go into different schools. And they actually, her fabrics make their work so professional and it really pops. And so, and I share her story and I ask that they always remember when they look at this work to remember this very famous artist that cared enough about them to make their work very professional. And each one of the girls created um, a block. They chose a famous woman from Pittsburgh and um, they did the research and then they chose fabric that represented the, you know, connected to the person's um, a passion. And then they all did their piece, but they did two. They made two blocks. So this is the one series here uh, that went to Children's Hospital. And this was done uh, through the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts and uh, the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. And James Gallery was the conduit to have the work placed. And then the second piece went to the school. So it hangs in the library. So they have mm -hmm. a record of the 250 anniversary for the Ellis School. So it's one of, I've had several opportunities over the years to be able to work with schools for special projects. Linden, I've been at Linden for all over 20 years, and I started when they had a 100th anniversary, so that tells you something. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I just saw one of the, the questions in the chat. Um, these are the quilts that are in this exhibition. This particular one you're looking at, the sister quilt, are not, is not in the exhibition, but I wanted to bring it into this conversation because it is a teaching quilt and it, um, you know, these girls created it with Tina. So let's move on to uh, your diaspora series. And we have um, two quilts, but this series of printed fabric was produced at AIR, which is Artist Image Resource, um, located on the north side of Pittsburgh, really a wonderful resource for artists here. Um, Tina received a grant in 2010 to learn the screen printing technique at AIR, which she uses in these quilts. Some designs were printed on paper for AIR's archive, and she's still using some of the fabric she made there today, or printed there today. So um, tell us a little bit, Tina, about, about these quilts and, and that technique, learning screen, screen printing. Well, first of all, it was a wonderful experience for me. And I also, not only did I get to work with um, Bob and Leslie Gollum and Jen Rocket, uh, they kind of walked me through the whole process. I really had, had no understanding at all on how to do a screen print. And um, so they were so excited about the project that, you know, they did, they went overboard. They did so much more than what the, the, uh, the, what the original idea was because he did multiple uh, screen prints in color for me on this work. So um, then after the work, you know, the work was done on the all medallions. All, all of this from the series is just the circle. And, and the circle has, this one has um, 
the what looks like a um, border on it, and it is the pattern of the African slave trade and where it started in Africa and how it went up through um, at, towards India. The, the arrows tell you where it goes. I was really surprised to see that many of the arrows went more went to South America and to Europe. Not only one actually went directly to the United States. We think that mm. the that the African slave trade really it impacted us. Ours was so brutal, you know. So it's always about us. But the um, the um, migration and the and the African slave trade went into South America and then came up through South America into the United States um, into North America, and then. The other thing that is interesting that I like to talk about is that the outer perimeter of the work is, is another realm. And those are all symbols that radiate from the um, Mediterranean. And I wanted to call everybody, call attention. These were, you know, first of all, I'm not an academic, I'm an artist, and these are interesting visual learning tools for me. Uh, so I just wanted to be able to understand like migration of people and how people migrated from one place to the other. And that it usually happened around water. I have a fascination with water. So um, the symbols that go around the outside are symbols that are around the Mediterranean. So that means that some of them are African and it goes around into Europe and then Spain and Portugal. So all of these, all of these symbols are to say we all really do rotate around the same sun. It, it is the it is the that it is hard to really pull it apart, and we are always trying to pull apart. But we're really pretty much all connected in the same way. And so then the crossbar in this is a um, image of the Nile River, which I you know I said let's talk about the Nile River because it flows from the south to the north and into the Mediterranean. So most, of the, a lot of the migration happened along this major river and went into, into um, the Mediterranean. And so, um, and, and then the fact that it flows from the south to the north was really interesting. And when I talk about that with the younger people, I also talk about how the Ohio River also that, that starts in Pittsburgh at our point goes north before it turns and goes south. So we do, you know, it's like a combination of symbols and art design and geography and how things make you feel and what, what do you think about. So all of these pieces are in, I travel with them to the schools and um, then the children explore it and they write about them. So it's, um, it's a really interesting thing to hear younger people. Some, I usually work middle school and elementary. Uh, but I have done high school students as well who really get involved with it. The, the same pattern that is on the left is the same pattern multiplied through um, on, on the right hand side. And the way the reason I wanted to do that was really to explore or to say this process that I've been going through and I started this in 2010 is like peeling back an onion. It's so vast and there's mm -hmm. so much information. And for me, I really need to work with like an archive, an archeological person and, and a historian to help to kind of like pull out these stories. But it is so overlapped and it's so much minutia that's there. Um, but the blues of the, and that's some of uh, Jan Meyer's blue shibori in the middle that just radiates there, it really, gives you the crossbar so that you can concentrate on that first and then you dig deeper. So how are we doing with time, Barbara? We're doing all right. I wanna move on to the next one, but I have to say I'm sitting here looking at this quilt, um, the struggle friction uh, quilt right across from me. So um, just for the, the audience, um, this Westmoreland Diversity Coalition billboard quilt um, is also not in the exhibition, but I hope you were able to see it when we had that exhibition here. Um, last year, but um, <clears throat> this project um, it was um, started in March 19, I mean 2020, and it was um, 
the Westmoreland Diversity Coalition in partnership with this museum put out a call to artists to participate in a public art campaign by responding to the me message, make our differences our strength. Using a billboard as their canvas, the artists were tasked to convey how diversity and inclusion make communities in Westmoreland County stronger. So over 50 artists responded to the call and 10 artists were selected by an advisory team. The project was funded by a generous grant from the Heinz Endowments Just Arts Program. And this is the quilt that Tina designed um, for this uh, project. And so if you could just talk a little bit about how you chose um, the theme here. Okay, so again, one of the things that I love to do is to show mixed cultures all in one spot. So each block has a multiple cultures that are represented either by imagery, a, a pattern, design, and, um, and, and then it's superimposed on the background. The fabrics are also, um, you try, it tries to move you from one point to the other. So if you were to look at this piece, it looks like um, a work that I did uh, called, um, um, oh, it's not gonna come right now, but mm -hmm. I, I, I yeah, like it was supposed to be a total, but it was an arc. So the arc was telling you the arc of justice, yoke of love was, which is the arc of justice was a, a theme of Martin Luther King. Um, when I first did it, my team, they weren't familiar with, and they said, nobody's gonna know what that is. But it was interesting after the billboard went up, there was a lot of reference to the arc of justice as it bends slowly. And then yoke of love, because my whole thought is anytime that you, work towards justice. You have to really have love in your heart for it because it's hard work. And the people that are, are involved in this, they really want justice. They, I mean, anytime that you see a wrong and you want to put, make it right, you have to love it. So that's, and so having these different cultures and then, like I said, there's, um, you know, we tried to get as many cultures as possible because it was diversity. So some of the uh, the, the patterns are Pennsylvania Dutch, the Tree of Life. Um, then it was the um, the the uh, brocades fabrics. So it's, it was a combination. You couldn't really see that on the billboard. So that was the that was the, I guess the challenge, but the, the graphic had to be there. But when you were able to see the piece itself up close, you could see all of the details that were there. But the main thing that I wanted to emphasize again is that the blocks were connected with mud cloth. So again, referencing the cradle of civilization and, and how it kind of connects and things uh, kind of radiate from, from there. And I like to use a lot of circles because it makes it move. Uh -huh. Well, you can see with the insert, that's the actual billboard. Um, the billboards were um, about 40 feet wide, some of them lo longer. And the quilt itself was 10 feet, um, 10 feet long. So it was an incredible piece. and this, this exhibition actually traveled around to three venues in, in Westmoreland County. So I hope some of you had an opportunity to see it. <clears throat> and so we're gonna move on to um, the next three quilts that you're gonna look at were all created during the pandemic. They're all in the exhibition um, and they're more introspective. So Tina, if you could just talk about um, them just a little bit. We've got, we still have a few more minutes here before okay. we have to do our final So video. I won't go too heavily in depth on, on, on what was, what was churning and what was part of that. I've never had an opportunity to be um, alone. And um, my husband transitioned about three years, four years ago, and I was busy with family and community work and business and teaching. And so all of a sudden it all stopped and I had to live in my house with the things that I had been collecting. And I decided that, you know, I needed to really think about what it means to be able to be alone. And, um, and then that song started to come back and you were never alone. And so, um, you know, you, as you walk through the life and the storms of life, you have to be resilient 
And it, it was about resilience. And I'm 72 years old and I'm kind of starting my whole life all over again. So I wanted to kind of like give myself uh, a breather. I wanted to just relax with it. And so um, my chosen religion is Catholicism. And so we always feel like we have our guardian angel that's there with us. Uh, and then I, I choose to overlap my Catholicism with a lot of Africanisms. And um, so I have the eye of Horus that is there. So you, you feel what you feel at first in your, in your heart. And then you project it from your heart through your eyes and out into the universe. And I, I think that that's what I try to do whenever I am creating artwork is to really emote the emotion, either through the energy of the shapes and the movement of the pieces. And so, um, so you know, that, that piece right there really kind of says we're never alone. We always have, have our, our spiritual connection to the world and that there's always hope and there's always faith to move forward. So that's pretty much what's going on with that. And piece. I think resilience is a good word for all of us through this past two years <laughs> yes. so, that we've lived through it. Um, and then these next two actually were um, two of four quilts that were made specifically for this exhibition. And so um, just say a few things about that and we'll show our very last video. Okay, and so, you know, the, the first of all, I have to give a cheer out to um, Leslie Gollum and Matt who uh, at Pool Proof who helped to create all of the fabric that's in these pieces. Uh, I am a scrap quilter, so maybe I didn't say that prior to, I'm a scrap quilter, so I used all the fabric that I had from when I was an interior decorator. So um, the, these pieces are created out of brand new fabric that was screen printed and digitally uh, printed uh, in New York for me to use. And so, um, and the genesis of, of this again, goes back to the whole thing about water. And when my husband and I start, you started thinking about the, um, there was a, a, there was a place out, outside of uh, Westinghouse High School in the, in the basement down, that down near Washington, uh, Washington Boulevard, and it was called Silver Lake. So Leslie and I started dreaming about what was Silver Lake really about. And it has a lot to do with the indigenous people that were here and how they uh, interacted with the land holistically. And so we started kind of thinking about, you know, where there maybe there were some spirits that were there. So we, we dropped it, that was in 2012. And then we kind of came back to it again. But it has morphed into not just, you know, a Native American experience, but an African experience. And again, I, I pulled in some of my, you know, traditional patterns, which is seed pods. I, you know, because it, I, I, feel, I call myself a planter of ideas and concepts mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, hopefully I'm around to see the fruits of those things. Um, and then there is the young girl, she's got a purple face and she's right behind that orange kind of undulating figure there. And um, she is, is a, she's a traveler. And the, the question is thinking about all of the children in, and now again, with what's going on in uh, Ukraine, is about how the children are able to survive these traumas. And so it has to have a place, you know, you have to have a place, this is a safe place for people to talk about it. So you see children surviving, being determined, and um, there are some indinkra, transparent and indinkra symbols that are there for knowledge, um, adaptability for, for the, the um, turtle is there. There's a snake and there's a like, kind of like uh, seaweed, there's a canoe, but let's talk more about the, the title, which is the title of the series, because it's again, me coming through my work, which is, whether or not you're going to put your oar into the water or are you going to just pull it up and drift along? 
And those, so there are cross work, cross road that are throughout the work again. They, they were throughout many of the works. So please go back, look at the other works that are in between. This will make more sense to you, but it's about the crossroads that we all have to make those decisions. And so this, this piece um, is the mother and child again. She seems like she's in a third dimension, uh, like in a vortex of, of water and maybe even like kind of passing through the end dream life. So these pieces are more dreamlike, more surrealism. Um, but I, I, th I hope that they are uh, stirring imagination and looking for resilience and determination. And then just to say, let's remember, let's remember the least of us. And that's our children. So that's that piece. And the other piece uh, is um, uh, Living Waters. And I just, you know, again, I think about Pittsburgh in so many ways about the Living Waters that are here and, and what, what, you know, what's underneath? What are we, what are we covering up? What is still there? The energy, because I'm an energy person. I believe that that's why I'm not always so sure that I come across when I'm doing, um, you know, like a Zoom, because I'm an energy person, so I like to look at people's eyes and see whether or not they, um, whether or not they're understanding what I'm saying, wh whether or not I'm rambling along. But <laughs> because it's like, but but it is right. about energy. Because I'll leave you with this, which is energy never dies. We are all energy, and so we have to remember. All that was is still is. So very true. I have to agree with that. So um, this last short little video um, explains the iconography in the quilt that our museum, the Westmoreland, purchased um, through the Westmoreland Society in 2019. And we're thrilled to have added it to the collection. It's not up at the moment because it's resting, but um, it will come out again um, shortly. So take a look at this and then we will come back to you. This is a story quote that I created called Divine Plan. And it was based on our relationship with the universe and the beginning. And so it has a rotation of clockwise it starts with the Trinity um, up here at the top. And if you find, follow the blackbirds, they come down and they go down and around. And once they go into the bottom, they go into the darkness, then they come back up again and into the top of the quilt. Now, this quilt encompasses several different techniques. It's all hand done and all hand beaded. Um, this is a, a discharged piece of fabric. It's hand printed and waxed. This up down here at the bottom is also discharged and uh, it has African symbols from Ghana there. Um, the new fabric is a fabric that I that was given to me from West Africa that I felt that it really fit into this because it had a feel of a, an organic feel to it of the, the pod. So it has a pod theme to it. So it comes down, it goes around. It gets involved in the center and then it moves back up again. And there's the quilt and it is um, 52 by 38 inches and it, it is really impressive. So I hope once we get it back out again, you'll come out and take a look at it. So thank you, Tina, for all that insight into your work. And so now we're opening up to questions and here comes Hannah. Hi. Yeah, we have a couple of questions. So one is from George. He says, the work is powerful and speaks with confidence and authority. What drew you to working in this medium? Where do you think this work will take you next? And then where further? Okay, so um, I, it, it, I fell into it basically because um, I was at home raising family. I was a potter and a weaver and a photographer. 
and I wasn't able to, I had a lot of restraints with those items, but I found that I could use the scraps that I had kind of brought out of the Joseph Horn Company every evening. And I had bags of it in the basement. So I just started to work with it. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed the communal activity once a week with other adults, first of all. The women were so giving and shared so much uh, and helped me along the way. It's just that I did not fit into that mold. And again, as I said before, that the encouragement came from one person to just say, have a good time, have fun and enjoy yourself. And so I created this collage technique just organically from my training, you know, with color. Um, you know, my, Dean Kanzani was um, a stickler for color movement and, and traveling reflective imagery. And so that I just used my training from college to create these pieces. But again, you, you just need to have the confidence and the belief in what you're doing. And, and I believed I was saving myself. This was the only control that I had. Everything else in my world was out of control, but this particular thing I could control myself. And then when people started to kind of like react to the stories, then I had to up my game and you know study a little bit harder. And it was back in the day when you had to go to the library. Now you can just Google everything and sit in your living room and <laughs> do all your research. True. Did that answer the question? I think so, yeah. Uh, another question from Bonnie is, how do you know when a piece is finished? It's never finished. <laughs> it, it, it's a, I, I, had, I do stop because, uh, but I can work back into any of these pieces if like, if there is a change in the atmosphere, is there is some, some additional information that, that is coming through maybe a decade later, I can work back into it if I still have the work. Uh, so, and because uh, they are pieces that are being reinterpreted and they're layered in such a way that sometimes people bring something new to it. So I can, because it's very forgiving. That's the, that's the thing, it's forgiving. We have another question from Leslie. Can you speak to your recent recognition in New York City, arts fairs, et cetera? Oh, well, last year was uh, a pretty pretty spectacular year. Um, uh, David DeBuck Gallery uh, took me on and a couple of years ago. And so I had an opportunity to uh, thread it, I think it's like thread it memories and it, um, was really very well received. It went to Christie's gallery for the 154 um, uh, art fair. And all of that was very new to me. I didn't even know what it was really about. It was just, I was going along with the wave, um, but it was pretty interesting to, and a divine, a very divine gift that I was out the gate and that I was chosen to uh, be spotlighted by um, by the, the art fair and asked to do um, like a talk. And then also last year was, um, I was, my work was presented at the Chicago fair as well. And again, it was like, it was, I didn't know, but it was, you know, it was spotlighted. And so the work is interesting. Maybe it's the time, it's the space and whatever, I'm not real sure, but it, it really gave me you know, like that push to, to really to explore the work a lot further. So I have some very good partners and I have a really great team of people who help me because I, no man is an island, I can't do it by myself. And when you get into the zone and you're working, you know, it's really difficult to do all the paperwork that goes along with it. Yeah, we have to give a shout out to Team Tina because they were <laughs> heavily involved in, in this exhibition and, um, and rightly so, Tina was recognized at the Chicago Expo and um, others, and the gallery is, is really representing her well. Um, prior to her work going to the gallery, she kept most of it pretty close to home and um, exhibited, but did not really sell. So now I think her work is getting out to the public. So it's, it's really a wonderful thing. 
Awesome. Thank you guys. Just one last question for you, Tina. This is again from George. Where do you see your work going? Oh, I don't know. I think with with the with the silk screen and the upgrade in the in the fabric, I, I think it's going to be more dreamlike, more cosmic, and um, more. In, in, it's always been emotional, and um, and so from from the very beginning when I started out with Carolyn Mass Lumi back in the early '90s, uh, showing with with some of her traveling shows. She, I just couldn't keep up with with all the other things that I was doing, but she really, really kind of catapulted me out into the world. So I've been local, but the work has traveled nicely through her contacts and with that group of women. Um, and so I'm not real sure. I, and you know what? Like I said, whatever it is for me will come. I just need to do the work, and I need to tell the truth, and I need to be honest. And I think as long as I'm doing those things that the bounty will come. That's my formula. <laughs> That's such a great answer. Thank it you is. so much, Tina. Um, a lot of our viewers are really resonating with your works. People find them very inspiring, especially the quilts that you've made during the pandemic. So thank you for sharing all of this with us. And thank you to the viewers for asking questions and being so attentive to our program tonight. Thank you so much. Um, anything to add, Tina or Barbara? Well, I'd like to say thank you very, very much to the Westmoreland Museum for picking up this show and, and getting it off the ground. It's been a thrill working with the staff. Everyone is so helpful and so encouraging, and it's been a wonderful experience. And um, I just want to say, I want to be a cheerleader for the Westmoreland. Oh. We well, appreciate that. Thank you. We do. And I just want to thank you, Tina, for, for all your hard work and, and for making this exhibition possible because our visitors are really enjoying it. So thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, My thank pleasure. you, everyone, very much. Before we end, I just want to thank you again for joining us. This was phenomenal. Um, be sure to check out our upcoming programs and events on our website and social media channels. We actually have a community day this Sunday, March 6th, and we're going to be celebrating Barbara Jones, our chief curator and her amazing career here at the Westmoreland. So hope to see you there. Thank you folks so much again, and we'll see you at the next one. Have a good night, everyone. Good Thank night. You. Bye.